Welcome to Kingdom Reality, your gateway to deep insights into the truths and realities of God's kingdom. Dive deep into the teachings of esteemed teachers of God's Word as they illuminate the mysteries of Scripture, offering priceless wisdom and revelations. Our channel serves as a beacon of enlightenment, guiding seekers on a transformative journey towards understanding the essence of divine truth and purpose. Join us as we explore the depths of spiritual reality and embark on a quest for genuine understanding and spiritual growth, revealing kingdom realities. In the vastness of the universe, one name stands above all Jesus. Join Apostle Michael Orakpo as he unveils the profound message, the person of Jesus. Explore the life and teachings of Jesus, the cornerstone of our faith. See how the love of Jesus unites and transforms lives across the world. Experience the power, love, and grace found in knowing Jesus personally, revealing the heart and person of Jesus Christ. We give you glory in Jesus' precious name. You may be seated because of our time. Thank you so much, choir. I wish we had time, but it's well. We, we, we trust God for a quick ascension. Tonight, because of the sensitive nature of the theme of this year's conference, I want to take out time to teach so that I can give perspective and understanding to someone who wants to really make the most of the conference. I'm persuaded that all of the dimensions of Christ that is made available to us will be communicated in the course of this conference via his essence, his character, his works, and his power. But for tonight, I just want to take out time to do a bit of exegesis to help us understand the person of the Christ, the person of Jesus Christ. Him that we have come to celebrate so that we can know him in a deeper way and then we can worship him accurately and draw from his reality. Glory to Jesus. Now, before I go into teaching on the person of Jesus, which is my emphasis tonight, let me show you the benefits of knowing and receiving Jesus so that you will know what you will receive if you have understanding of this excellent personality and if you receive him graciously, what will become of you. The name Jesus actually means salvation. So the very essence of his being is to bring man into his fullness as ordained by God. So when a man receives and encounters Jesus, there are many benefits. Some of them are earthly, others are eternal. Ranging from miracles, healing, deliverances, which are all the benefits you have in time. But I want to show you 12 eternal benefits of knowing Jesus before I go into expounding on the person of Christ so that you can appreciate the knowledge of God. If man was not falling, our greatest preoccupation would have been the search and the study of God. The Bible said in the cool of the day, the voice of God came walking in the garden and the man was interacting with God every day to know him and to grow in his essence. In fact, there are three things that defines the meaning of existence. If you do not have these three things, your existence is a waste. It doesn't matter for how long you lived. The first thing that gives relevance to existence is the knowledge of God. The Bible said in John 17 verse 3, it said, This is life eternal, that you may know him, the only true God, and him whom he has sent. So as far as eternity is concerned, life is beyond breath. The meaning of life is beyond what you have. The Bible is telling us that the quality and the relevance of a man's life is the degree to which he experiences God. And so the first thing that substantiates your existence is the knowledge of God. If you have not known God by experience, your stay here is a waste. And you may not realize it until you cross the veil of time into eternity. Then it will down on you that the pursuit of car, the pursuit of money, were all instruments put together to help you fulfill purpose. But the meaning of life was deeper than that. The second thing that gives value to existence is the worship of God. The Bible said in Revelation chapter 4 verse 11, it says, all things were created for thy pleasure. And the way God derives pleasure is for creation to worship him. 
This is why Jesus was speaking in John 4, 24. He said that God seeketh those who will worship in spirit and in truth. Now, men are seekers of God. But it will shock you that God also is seeking a particular type of people. And the people God is seeking are those who will worship him. Because that's the only thing that gives pleasure to this eternal spirit. And so when a man does not know how to worship God, his existence counts for little or for nothing. And then the third thing that gives meaning to your existence is the degree to which you participate in advancing God's agenda. God has a purpose on the face of the earth. No spirit is without an agenda. This is why every spirit, both God and demonic entities, are looking for men to serve them. Because they have an agenda to colonize this realm. God is a king. And the glory of every king is the territory that he occupies. And the territory where he exerts his dominion. And so God has an agenda to conquer this realm so that every being in this realm will serve his will and his purpose. Now, the degree to which you participate and cooperate with God to make that happen is what gives you relevance. And so tonight, we are studying the person of Jesus. We are trying to understand who Jesus is. And that is one of the most important things that defines life. Because knowing God, like I said, is what gives value to your life. But before we study to understand who Jesus is, let me show you 12 eternal benefits that knowing Jesus will confer to your life. Number one, if you don't know Jesus, you cannot be forgiven. Forgiveness of sins is only possible on the platform of the encounter of Jesus Christ. And it will, let, it will shock you that spirits actually don't forgive. Spirits don't know how to forgive. When the Bible speaks about forgiveness, it's not pardon. You know, you understand forgiveness from the sense of the English and you think it's to pardon you for an offense. Spirits can't pardon you when you offend because they operate in a legalistic realm. The Bible said the wages of sin is death. So anyone who sins must die. So when we speak about forgiveness in eternal context, we're actually talking about a price that was paid for your sins to be washed away. So when God sees you, he doesn't see sin. And that cannot happen except as somebody takes your guilt so that he replaces you and takes your judgment. And the only one who has the capacity, the stature to stand in your place and to take your guilt is Jesus Christ. So in Christ, we have forgiveness not because God pardoned us, but because he took our place. Our sins were credited to him. Our judgment was put upon him and he died our death. So all of us died. When he said the wages of sin is death, as far as God is concerned, he killed you. When Jesus died, you died. So it is only in Christ that forgiveness is possible. This is why anybody who wants to ever have a relationship with God must meet Jesus. In, the, in theology, we call it expiation and propitiation. In expiation, your sins are washed from you. In propitiation, the consequences of your sin is put on Jesus Christ. This is why forgiveness is possible. It has nothing to do with pity or sympathy. It's a legalistic reality in the realm of God. So when Jesus hung on the cross, you hung with him. When Jesus hung on the cross, what your sin was put upon him. And he was killed because you should have been killed. That is why you have forgiveness. <laughs> in Ephesians 1 7 is that in whom we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace without Christ there is no forgiveness and if you cannot if you are not forgiven you can't participate in the commonwealth of Israel the second benefit of knowing Jesus is the receipt of eternal life if you don't have Jesus you don't have life man was created to operate by three lives the first life is in the blood that's the animal life and unfortunately, if that's all the life you have, you are not different from the, the other animals around. Because goats too have blood life. Leviticus 17 verse 11 said the life of the flesh is in the blood. So every man has life in his blood. But man has another higher kind of life. Called suke is the life of the soul. Genesis 2 verse 7. It said when God created man, he breathed the breath of life into his nostril. And the man became a living soul. That's why when breath departs, you die. Because the life that sustains your personality, sustains your soul, is hinged on your breath. And God put it there. That life is also what, what works intelligence. The reason we can function as higher beings is because there is a life that powers intelligence. But that's not all the life that man was designed to function with. In Genesis 2 verse 9, the Bible said God planted a garden in the east side of Eden. And he planted the tree of life there. So he wanted man to eat that life so that his spirit 
can be sustained. So there is a life that sustains the body. There is a life that sustains the soul. And there is the life that sustains the spirit man. Outside of Jesus, you cannot have the spirit life. Because the moment man fell, that tree was removed from the garden of Eden. The only place you can find that life now is in Christ. So anybody who does not have Christ has two kinds of life. The flesh and the soul. See, the people of the world think we are the same. We are not the same. When they die, their life ends in hell. When we die, we don't die. We cross over to glory. Because there is a life that sustains us. And only in Christ can that life be found. John 3.16, it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The reason you will not perish is because you have the life of God. And that life came to you when you received Jesus. In 1 John 5, 11 to 13, he said, this is the record. Whoever has the, has the son has life. And he said, these things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. Why? Because in verse 12, he told us, the life is in the son. So if you have the son, you have eternal life. And if you have eternal life, you will not perish. Brothers and sisters, I am sure of my eternity. Because I have the life of God. It's a benefit that is available only to those who know Jesus. Number three benefit of knowing Jesus is sonship. I'm no longer a stranger in the house of God. I am in the family of God. God has become my father. The moment you receive Christ, you become a participator in the family of God. And at least those of you who have families here, you know the blessings of family. No matter how a stranger is entertained, he remains a stranger. Only a son can make demand. Only a son can enjoy rights, not privileges. Anything you give a stranger is a privilege. But when you come as a son, it becomes your right. A child can wake up in the morning and say, Mommy, where is food? He doesn't care what mommy does. Food has to come. Because as far as it's concerned, eating is not a privilege. Eating is a right. The moment the parents gave birth to him, they put a responsibility on themselves to provide for him. This is why everything we receive in this kingdom, we receive audaciously. We don't beg for healing. We don't beg for blessings. It is our right in God. The Bible said in John chapter 1, from verse 11, he came unto his own. His own received him not. He said, but as many as received him. To them, he didn't say privilege. He gave the power or the right to be called the sons of God. So if you are in Christ, you are a legal member of the family of God. God becomes your father. The whole world can see God as one sovereign being somewhere far in the heavens, not us. We see God as our father. That's why we approach him, we say, our father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. So he is God, but he's also our father. So we have a, a relationship with him that binds us with him and binds him to us because Christ, we have received Christ. As many as received him, to them he gave the right. I'm a son of God. I don't beg for protection. I don't beg for provision. I don't beg for progress. God takes it as his responsibility to provide it. When I come to him, I come boldly because I'm a member of the family of God. Listen, if you understand this truth, it will change the quality of your Christian life. There are many people lying down begging, Lord, if he pleases you, give me food. No son begs the father for food. Even parents who are wicked know how to give food to their children. Don't you know that thieves, when they steal, they buy food home and take food home? Thieves and armed robbers. Is it the God that is gracious and benevolent that you have to beg for food? Yet, there are many Christians begging, Father, if you will have mercy, provide bread today. They lack understanding. When you pray like that, even your father is shocked. Imagine if your son comes to you in the morning and says, Lord, Daddy, if he pleases you, can we have breakfast? You will look at him and say, what's wrong with you? What is wrong with you? If he, am I that wicked? Meanwhile, most of our prayer is a suggestion that God is not caring. Because we don't know that God is our father. The moment you receive Christ, you became the son of God. Number four, you now have access to God. Receiving Christ, knowing Christ, gives you access to God. Ephesians 2.18, it says, for through him, we both have access by one spirit unto the father jesus speaking in john 14 verse 6 he said i am the way i am the truth i am the life he said no one cometh to the father except through me see there are many religions in the world observing a lot of penance 
hoping that they will have relationship with God is unfortunate. Jesus didn't say, I am a way. If he said, I am a way, it would have suggested that there are other ways. There is only one way to the Father. That way is Jesus Christ. If you like, cut your skin. If you like, travel for a pilgrimage somewhere. If you like, fast for 100 years. If you don't have Christ, you have no access to the Father. For those of us who are born of God, we are with God and God is with us. And guess what? If you know God is with you, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you fear no evil for God is with you. Even in the presence of your enemies, your cup runs over. Why do you think most people when, see, go and check mature believers. You will be shocked the way they pray. You, they, you will be shocked. There is assurance. The psalmist knew that if God is with him, even in the valley of the shadow of death, there's no cause for alarm. Even in the midst of his enemies, there's no cause for alarm. How, 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 what kind of audacity is that? It's an audacity that is born from an awareness that God is with you. And this is what knowing and receiving Jesus makes available. Number five, regeneration and transformation. You can never be a better person except as you encounter Jesus. Giving people rules and regulations to be better is like baiting a pig and hoping that the pig will be clean. It is not possible. The nature is wrong. So transformation is not possible. But the moment you receive Christ, something happened to you. The Bible said, whoever is in Christ Jesus, 2 Corinthians 5.17, is a new creature. It said, all things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. From the position of the new nature you have, you can now be transformed into your best version. And I wish I have time to show you levels of transformation. Transformation begins from renewal of mind, but it doesn't stop there. It moves to mortification of flesh, but it doesn't stop there. It moves to transfiguration. If you are transformed, a point will come when, when people see you, you will literally be like God. And all of these possibilities are available to the Christian on the platform of the encounter with Jesus Christ. And that's not all. Authority over demons and circumstances. As Christians, as people who know Jesus, as people who have Jesus, we give commandment in the spirit realm. You know, a politician can give commandment maybe because he's sitting in an office and when his tenure expires, he leaves. Not a Christian. We don't only give commandment in the natural realm. When we come, even demons know that we have authority to address them. Jesus said in Mark 16, 15, it says, they that believe and are baptized shall be saved. In verse 17, he said, These signs shall follow them that believe. He said, In my name, they shall cast out devils. Listen, we give laws to demons. We command demons and they obey. We are not of them who are frustrated and stranded because of demonic activity. Everything the devil wants to do, let him go ahead. It's a platform for manifestation. Because when you show up, you exert and exercise your authority over demons. Why? Because you know and you have Jesus Christ. So, the moment you have Jesus, Satan is no longer an issue. You command him and he obeys. Somebody was telling me some years ago when I started traveling. He said, this city you are going to. They say there are international demons there. I say, those ones are not enough. They should invite all the demons. It doesn't make any difference. Because my Bible told me, having spoiled principalities and powers... He made a public show. It's not a private. It's a public show. Every demon knows that Jesus has triumphed. And when I come in the name of Jesus, I'm not using my credentials. I'm using the credentials of the one who defeated them already. So I, the demon can be local. It can be international. It doesn't matter. See, this is why you must fight to know Jesus. Those of us who know him, we exercise authority. We exercise dominion. It's not something that happens once in a while. It's our lifestyle. Now we give commandments. We have become like kings because that's what Jesus made us. And that's not all. Knowing Jesus also gives you peace. Peace that surpasses knowledge. John 14, 27, he said, peace I leave you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world give it. See, the world can't give peace. The world gives happiness. Happiness is in the soul. Peace is in the spirit. It's a different thing entirely. If you buy a car, you can be happy. If they give you money, you can be happy. But when you have peace, come what may, you are like Mount Zion that cannot be moved. Nothing can shake you. 
That's what Jesus was saying he has given to us. He said, my peace I leave you. He said, not as the world give it. The peace I am giving you is a peace that surpasses knowledge. So people can understand why there is chaos. You are not moved. It's because there is a guarantee. There is an assurance that nothing can shake you. You have become like Mount Zion. And that's not all. Knowing and receiving Jesus also gives you joy and strength. When you find people who celebrate, even when things are not working well, know that they know something beyond fact. They are seeing something beyond the natural realm. In John 15, 11, he said, These things I have spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you. And what is his joy? Nehemiah 8, 10, the joy of the Lord is my strength. This is why you find many Christians, they fall seven times, they rise again. And you are wondering, what is the secret of your strength? Is the joy of the Lord. Nothing you throw at us can destabilize us. Because the way the devil fights is to disorient you. When you are disoriented, then he attacks. But when you have Jesus, even in the midst of the storm, you can rise up and say, peace be still. Because you are in control. Your life is no longer regulated by the things happening around you. You have become stronger than the things happening around you. Number nine, when you have Jesus, you have wisdom. 1 Corinthians 1, 23, 24, and 30. It says, but we preach Christ crucified unto the Jews a stumbling block. Unto the Greek foolishness. He said, but unto us who are called, both Jews and Greek, Christ is the power of God and the wisdom of God. In verse 30, he said, but of him are ye in Christ, who of God is made unto you wisdom. So I know more than my teachers. In the midst of confusion, you just know what to do. Not because you read the book. The Bible said, when you come to that place, he said, don't worry what you will say. Open your mouth and we fill it with words. Why do you think men are not making progress? It's because of lack of direction. It's because of poor decision making. But one who has Christ, Christ becomes wisdom on his inside. If you will engage him in the midst of the storm, you will know what to do. Even when you are in the wrong direction, he said, you will hear a voice behind you telling you, this is the way to go. So we have come into a level of perfection because there's supernatural wisdom at work in us. Everybody can be running to invest. You want to enter. You hear a check. They are making 200 profit, 200% 200 profit. I need to. You want to enter. You just relax. One week later, they tell you the business crashed. You don't read that one in Harvard. You encounter it in Christ. And these are the things that make you become like the wind. Nobody can explain you. Somebody shows up. Everybody is friends with him. You want to join them. You pick a check. You stop. Two weeks later, you hear that he has swindled them. And you are wondering, why has my life come into so much precision? Christ has become your wisdom. See, from time to time, when you wake up from bed, tell yourself, I don't make mistakes. Christ is my wisdom. I will not fall into error. Christ is my wisdom. I will not marry the wrong person. Christ is my wisdom. I will not. I, see, this is what gives us precision in life. Oh, the lady shows up. She's glowing like a bulb. You want to? The man shows up. His chest is like a, a weightlifter. Everything is in perspective. Height, gallant, open teeth. He's moving like a prince. He talks to you. You can't sleep. You want to say yes, you pick a sign. You pick a sign. And you say no. Two months later, you hear that it's something else. And you are wondering, how did I know Christ is in me? How did I know Jesus is my light? How did I know Jesus is my wisdom? This is why you must have Jesus. Our world is treacherous. Many people dressed in suit, they are a package of deception. Trying to swindle those who don't have discernment. But for those of us who have Christ, even when we step, a voice will tell us, come back. That's not the direction to go. So our life comes into precision. This is why in this conference, you must encounter Jesus. Number 10, Jesus is your righteousness. And I wish I have time to explain what righteousness is. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, it said to with God, it said God made him that was without sin to become sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Righteousness is the nature of God that causes him to walk in eternal perfection. And that nature of God is not just the ability to do right. It's actually the power to make anything you say to be so. Why do you think God can't err? Because anything God says, it becomes. If God looks at you now, you are dark. He says, brother, why are you fair? 
If you look at yourself, you'll discover you are fair. So righteousness is not just accuracy, it's power. That's why God can look at darkness and light be. And light shows up from nowhere. So Jesus has made us righteous in God. So we are not just living above sin, but anything we say becomes. Oh, you are doing a business, they tell you it will fail. You say, no, nothing I touch fail. You are going somewhere, they say this journey will not make sense. There's no hope in it. You say, no, there is hope in it. Because you said it, it becomes. How do you think we pray for the sick and they are healed? The doctor say he has cancer. We come, we say, no, you don't have cancer. The doctor is speaking from fact. We are speaking from righteousness. What we say become. And it's not because we are special. It's because Jesus is our righteousness. Jesus is our righteousness. Some of you succeed in business. Not because you have all the data. Not because you have all the fact. In fact, after investing in that business, you discover you shouldn't have gone ahead. But there is something about you that whatsoever you touch prospers. Whatsoever you do prosper is the righteous spirit at you that is making it happen. He said, whatsoever the righteous do it, it shall prosper. That's what it means to have Jesus. He makes you. That's why Romans 5.17 said, we receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness so we reign in life. Righteousness makes you a ruler in life. So encountering Jesus is not a religious thing. When we call this conference, Jesus conference, it's not for Christians to come and dance and shout the name of Jesus. No, there must be a revelation behind it. When I say Jesus, I am declaring that I'm righteous. I'm declaring that I reign and I rule in life. Nothing about me fails. People look at some of us and say, well, they will soon fail. <laughs> say, you are wasting your time. Even if I want to fail, it's too late. I now know something that can't allow me fail. You can't. You have to learn to fail now. And you can't understand that syllabus. Because righteousness won't let you. There's a power at work. Now, I decree over somebody. Because of the encounters you have had so far, the river of righteousness begins to flow out of you. Yeah. Sit down for a moment. Number 11, love. When you know Jesus, the love of God begins to overwhelm you the love of god romans 5 35 to 39 it says who shall separate us from the love of christ shall tribulation shall distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peri or sword is it as it is written for thy sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. He said, nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. He said, for I am persuaded, neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor heights, nor depths, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. When you find Christians that leave church because they offended them in choir, they encounter church, they didn't encounter Jesus. Oh, why would they talk to me like that? I'm not going there anymore. You are a religious man. You have not encountered Jesus. When you have encountered Jesus, not even death can separate you. Not tribulation can separate you. Not accusation can separate you. In fact, when they persecute you, you will consider it an honor. Did you not read about the apostles? The Bible said they gathered them. They flogged them and told them never to preach in the name of God. He said they returned to their company and they celebrated. We too have been counted worthy to be persecuted for Jesus. We have many religious men who have not encountered the Lord. If you encounter Jesus, try us. It's an advantage. Tribulation is your record. Accusation is your promotion. Everything they throw against you becomes an advantage that you celebrate. Because for his sake, even if you have to lay down your life, you will. In Acts chapter 15 verse 26, the Bible said, Paul and Barnabas, he said, this be the men that hazarded their lives for the sake of the gospel of Christ. Some were not waiting to be persecuted. They were taking risk for Jesus. But here is a generation where men can't go for evangelism. They can't endure anything for Jesus because we have not encountered him. The love of God has not yet come alive in our spirit. Finally, benefit of knowing Jesus is faith. When you encounter Jesus, something is formed in your spirit that nothing can intimidate you anymore. 
you can look at a mountain and say be thou removed even you will not know how but faith has come alive jesus the testimony of jesus activates faith in your spirit and only those who have faith are victorious the bible said this is the victory that overcomes the world first john 5 4 even our faith see these things are superior to hands being laid on you these are the the the, the, the things that your life is built upon that nothing can shake you not because somebody promised you something but because a substance have been formed on your inside in romans 10 verse 16 and 17 it said but they have not all obeyed the gospel for isaiah said who has believed our report that's the testimony of jesus and he said so then faith cometh by hearing by hearing the testimony of the report about jesus christ so when you find people that nothing defies there's faith at work in their spirit and in the face of a mountain they keep moving forward nothing stops them these are eternal benefits of knowing jesus now having enumerated these benefits let's attempt to look at who jesus is i said that to help you focus and make up your mind if jesus brings faith if jesus brings righteousness if jesus brings empowerment and authority if jesus brings peace if jesus brings joy if jesus brings eternal life then i want to know him if you are if you are saying that let's go on the ride now let me show you who jesus is trusting that the holy ghost will reveal him to you <laughs> this is the most important knowledge that everybody especially believers must have i beg you don't do religion religion will wreck you have a relationship with god through his son jesus christ and your life will be the envy of your generation i want to attempt to advance my teaching now explaining who jesus is i want to start teaching now i'm done with my introduction <laughs> I came tonight as a teacher. Mahela Vaita, Kibarado, Bararida, Rakebano Savakata. Don't worry, thank you. Sit down. In order to understand the person of Jesus, let's look at Matthew 16, verse 13. Don't worry. Five minutes to rounding up will shift the atmosphere. <laughs> you know, dealing with the needs of men are the easiest things. If men are taught truth and they are raised, a lot of things will no longer be necessary. I'm telling you. I can come here now, charge through a teaching and release the power of God. You may need me again. Or you will keep needing pastor to pray every day. But if you know what I'm teaching you, you will come here because you love God. You will serve because you love God. You will become the testimony that God is faithful. Glory to God. Jesus was speaking in Matthew 16 verse 13. He said, when Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say I, the son of man, I am? If you read this scripture, something will shock you. That a whole generation didn't know him. Meanwhile, if you come into the synagogue, there were people with gray hair and beard that is as long to their chest level. They carry the Torah and move about with it they are strange creatures to behold. In fact, when they go to the market and they are coming home, they wash their feet, their hands, and their legs because they've touched sinners. High-level religious men, but they didn't know him. Look at all of the answers that were gathered from the predominant school of thought. He said, and they said, some say. When they say some say, these are not individuals. Oh. 
These are schools of thought. These are theological seminaries of those days. It says some say you are John the Baptist. Why are they saying so? Because they thought that he came back to life from the dead. And because of the power over death, they assume he was the one. They say some say you are Elias. That's Elijah. Because of the miracles. Only Elijah could operate that level of miracle. He says some say you are Jeremiah. Because of righteous teaching. He looks at the Pharisees and says you are hypocrite. You know, Jeremiah is a prophet of truth. When they preach his people weep. So when they were judging him, they were judging him from the periphery. And others said you are one of the prophets. So they scaled him at the level of a prophet. That was their biggest revelation of Jesus. Jesus now turned to his own disciples and asked them, since they don't know, let's assume that the whole institution is a waste of money and time. You that have followed me up to now, who do you say I am? Everybody kept quiet because even they didn't know. That you are around does not mean you are It must be revealed to you. This is why you have to humble yourself. You know, people come to church and act like peacock. They know everything. You are joking. <laughs> that you are around does not mean you know. It must be revealed. So you need humility. Peter spoke and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus looked at him and said, You didn't answer this from your brain. Because you too don't know it. Flesh and blood have not revealed this to you. He said, my father which is in heaven has revealed this to you. And he said, upon this revelation you have brought, <laughs> I will build my church and the gate of hell shall not prevail. Now, the first thing Jesus showed us here is that when you know me, you have moved from the level of deliverance. You have moved to a level where Satan can afflict you. Have you been touched by the message you just heard and you want to give your life to Jesus or you want to rededicate your life to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Then say this short prayer. Lord, I admit I am a sinner. I need and want your forgiveness. I accept your death as the penalty for my sin and recognize that your mercy and grace is a gift you offer to me because of your great love, not based on anything I have done. Cleanse me and make me your child. Be faithy receive you into my heart as the Son of God and as Savior and Lord of my life. From now on, help me live for you, with you in control. Dot in your precious name. Amen. Congratulations to you. If you have just said that prayer, you are now a child of God. Look around you for a Bible-believing church and also ask Jesus to direct you to the church where you can continue to serve him. Consider subscribing to this channel too, so that you'll keep learning the realities of God's kingdom. God bless you.